welcome back everyone to RM Military History and today we have another treat for you. We have Richard Easton who is going to tell us all about GPS and its role in warfare. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on Richard. If you'd like to just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and, and GPS. Well my father worked on the space program from 1953 to 1980 and uh, actually 1952. And the first launch he saw wasn't supposed to be a launch. He was working on Viking uh, project for the Naval Research Lab and they were doing upper atmospheric research. And Viking 8 in June of 1952, they were doing what was supposed to be a test firing of the rockets. You know, you see SpaceX, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they test the rocket to make sure it's working before they launch. Well, Martin changed, the major contractor changed the way the rocket was bolted down. And there was so much vibration from the rocket that it took off during what was supposed to be a test firing. So complete loss, you know, they, they didn't have it configured. Sometimes movies like The Right Stuff, you'll see all the the early, you know, the, the early astronauts watching these Atlas rockets blowing up time after time. And uh, you, even before the, the manned space program, you saw that with, uh, with Viking 8. Mm. So 1955, the International Geophysical Year is coming up and the US announces it's going to launch a satellite. There's a competition between the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. And my father co-wrote the proposal for the Navy, which won. He started working on Project Vanguard. He was working on the mini track tracking system and the small test vehicle satellites. Once they had it operational, they were gonna use larger 20, 20, 20 to 50 inch satellites. But for the early test launches, the, um, they were gonna use a six and a half inch, uh, three and a half pound satellite, which dad used to tinker with on our dining room table. Oh, wow. You know, you're talking, down, talking about in lockdown, you know, bring your work home. Sure. Well, it, in that day, you could bring satellites. You didn't have a green room. You didn't have to worry about, you know, germs uh, infecting Mars. You just wanted to get the blasted thing up. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, TB3 blows up. You know, the Soviets launched Sputnik 1 on October 4th, Sputnik 2 in November with a dog on board. And suddenly the Eisenhower administration announces that TB3 will launch a satellite, which uh, the Vanguard people thought was unlikely and it blows up about four feet in the air. Oh, wow. uh, it's called Flopnik. <laughs> and dad bought a seat for it. The satellite on the way home brought it in its little wood box. It sat in our house overnight and you can now see it at the Air and Space Museum. So to fast forward to, okay, GPS, Global Positioning System. How did that happen? Uh, right after Sputnik 1, was launched, Bill Geyer and George Weifenbach of the Applied Physics Lab were tracking it using the Doppler of its signal. So, you know, a train, if it's moving towards you, the train whistle gets higher in pitch. If it's moving away from you, it gets lower in pitch. Mm -hmm. So they were using the same thing with the radio waves from Sputnik. And about six months later, their boss said, gee, can't you turn that into a navigation system? So instead of using multiple ground stations to track a satellite, use multiple satellites to give positions of receivers. And their system was called Transit. It was the first operational NAVSAT or SATNAV. Um, it was good for Polaris missile submarines. So, you know, the Polaris submarine has inertial navigation and they can correct it every so often by, uh, by checking the transit satellites. Uh, it was two dimensional system. 
generally available about once an hour. Um, and the Pentagon in 1968 realized they need a much more robust system. Three-dimensional, worldwide, always available. Uh, my father started working on his timation for time navigation system in 64. He was talking with another uh, naval scientist, Dr. Arnold Shostak, and some of you people might know Seth Shostak, who's been involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They were talking about the hydrogen maser, which started in 1960, and that that could make a uh, time navigation system where if you know what time the signal left the satellite and what time you receive it, you're on the surface of the sphere. You know, if you're a tenth of a sat second from the satellite, light travels 186,000 miles per second. So you'd be 18,600 miles from the satellite. Mm. And with four satellites in sight, you can get your three-dimensional position and your time synchronization. So that's how GPS works. Mm. And that's what my dad was researching with the idea of eventually getting atomic clocks in the satellites. He launched his first satellite, Timation 1 in 67, Timation 2 in 69. And he, was, he and one of his colleagues at the time division section of the Royal Observatory were using Timation 2 to synchronize time between the Naval Observatory in Washington and the Royal Observatory. So, so uh, British people can be proud of the fact that early on, even before there was GPS, yeah. they were cooperating. Sure. It was not, not just the Americans. You folks were making valuable contributions. <laughs> so um, the military decided that the Air Force was working on another system called 621B. They decided to merge the two systems in 1973 and uh, almost as soon as the systems were merged, the Navy and the Air Force were already arguing over who did what. So, uh, we had, we had, <laughs> so the first GPS test satellite was launched in 1978. Uh, one thing that may have saved the system, you know, early on the military, gee, what is this GPS? You know, I'd prefer to have another aircraft or another destroyer rather than this nebulous system that 10 years from right now might have a payoff. But they realized that they had nuclear detection satellites that could detect nuclear attacks and, and aid in recovery, that GPS satellites would be ideal for that. So they started putting nuclear detection devices on the satellites. So suddenly you had two constituencies. GPS really took off with the first Gulf War. Uh, and one bit of trivia is most of the receivers used in the first Gulf War were civilian. You know, military procurement tends to take a long time, mm -hmm. be expensive. And a lot of soldiers, you know, they had the family sending them a garment oh, wow. to Saudi Arabia. So, uh, <laughs> and early on, some of the weapons were falling short or long, and they realized some people were using different grid systems, 1984 versus 1972. So you, you have a different grid system. It's, it's like on Apollo 8, the first mission to the moon, NASA found that different tracking stations were giving different positions for Apollo 8, and they realized there were errors in the position of the ground station. So they had to fix that, and then they got, you know, all the different yeah. ground stations yeah. giving the same. I remember position. my remember my dad before we went on holiday to France to look at the battlefield. He'd be updating his TomTom -tom. from a civilian point of view. That it, it was probably even more confusing in a military sense. Yeah, yeah. So, so of course, GPS has become so important. Everybody wants one. Uh, the Soviets and then the Russians have their GLONASS system. It fell into hard times in the 1990s with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. but they built it back. 
the Europeans have the Galileo system. And at one point I was talking to a gentleman who was over GPS in the late 90s and the Europeans wanted to buy in and have some say so. And President Clinton said, no, we wanted to keep it an American system. So the Europeans had their Galileo system. The Chinese at one point were investing in that and then they had a falling out. So the Chinese had their Beidou system. So you have four global systems and two regional constellation, the, uh, the Indians and the Japanese. I, I've mentioned you have to have four satellites in sight. If you're in Tokyo with a lot of tall buildings, you may have difficulty navigating. So they have uh, satellites in geosynchronous orbit at the um, longitude of Tokyo or Japan to supplement the other systems. So, yeah. so that's a very, very short summation mm. of GPS. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. You know, it's something that we, we all take for granted. Could you possibly tell us a little bit more about its, its military usage today? Obviously, tracking where ships and airplanes are. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems in 1973 was that the Air Force system, 621B, was going to be regional constellations in either geosynchronous or high inclined orbits and not necessarily a worldwide system. The Navy was worried they might build a European constellation and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And there was also fear that the Soviets would call the European constellation a, a spy system, since it would be over uh, Soviet borders a fair bit of the time. And GPS and my dad's timation system with circular 12 hour orbits were much more robust because they'd be going over a number of ground stations. So knocking out one ground station would not knock out the system. Sure. So GPS, um, you know, the first Gulf War, they didn't have that many smart bombs, but with GPS, you could tell where the airplane was much more accurately when it dropped the bombs. So even though in 1991, most of the bombs were not smart. GPS helped by, by you knew where the, exactly where the plane was when it dropped the bombs. First Gulf War, Saddam Hussein was very surprised with the left hook because you know the Iraqis would get lost in the desert. Yeah. So knowing exactly where the units were, you know they had a dust storm, sandstorm which actually helped the allies because they knew where they were and the Iraqis didn't know where they were, yeah, despite of the fact they were in their own country. And it also helped um, with uh, avoiding friendly fire and the timing, the initial helicopters that went and knocked out those Iraqi radar stations in Western Iraq, they were using GPS synchronized time because they wanted to attack very precisely. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just like uh, uh, D-Day, you know, certain, certain things had to happen first. Sure, sure. To knock out, knock out the radar. So it helps in terms of telling you where you are mm. and where you're dropping bombs, reducing collateral damage. Of course, other countries see what the US and allies have done and they, they change their tactics. You know, they, you, you suddenly go with guerrilla tactics. You try to make, make it harder to tell the difference between friend or foe. Yeah. And, um, you know, so we've seen that in Iraq where, where again, a, a guerrilla, it's, it's much harder to, to hit a target as opposed to fighting a uniformed army. Was there sort of a a war between the the Western powers and the and the uh, communists. The Soviets, as I mentioned, they start the the U.S. launched its first Block One test satellite for yeah. GPS in 1978. The Soviets launched their first GLONASS mm. satellite in 1982. 
Yeah, uh, just, just as I mentioned transit, uh, starting in 1960, the Soviets launched a, a similar Doppler-based system starting in 67. So you see, you know, gee, yeah. the enemy has this smart new thing. We've yeah. got to get it too. I wonder if they ever sort of try to uh, sabotage each other. Certainly today, there, there's jamming around, you know, we've seen jamming incidents that that we believe the Russians were doing in the Black Sea sure. and jamming around where Putin is located. So, so and there's um, spoofing is another another element. I mean, the, the US is gradually launching its GPS three satellites that will have a more powerful signal and, and more frequencies at which they're broadcasting and, and a lot of people say we need backups for GPS, like enhanced LoRaN or improved inertial navigation system. If there was a big solar storm, like what happened in 1859, so-called Carrington event, you know, the uh, teletype, telegraph of the day, those systems were severely damaged by, by the 1859 storm. Another storm like that today uh, could degrade the GNSS systems, global navigation satellite system, including GPS and the, the rivals. So, mm. uh, so uh, we definitely need backup systems. Sure. And they've been talking about it for a long time in the US, much talk, but like the election, much talk, not much actually happening. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, is there anything else you, you'd like to add? One of the high points, uh, my co-author and I got invited to go out to Air Force Space Command in 2016, oh, and wow. we gave a talk that General John Hyten, who was then the four-star general in charge of Air Force Space Command, introduced it. So, And we got to see two SOPs where they actually control GPS. Wow. So, so that was neat. I mean, over here we sort of when when space command was was rolled out, it was a bit of a, a bit of a joke. Sort of over here, you know, you saw all the the pictures of of Star Wars and Star Trek and things. In two thousand six, when my father received the National Medal of Technology from President Bush, George Lucas got it for his oh, great. his company, and my dad was introduced to Lucas as the real Star Wars. So fantastic. Uh, <laughs> That's fantastic. I uh, want to say again, a, a big, big thank you to Richard for coming on the channel. Uh, a link to his book um, in the description below. And of course, yet again, uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel. We've got some great things coming up. Uh, thank you again, Richard. It's been a delight. Thanks for having me.